There is a moment in every movie when every single one of us leave. And the movie's not done. The movie's still going, and yet every single one of us, without a doubt, have left. And the moment is when the list of names starts scrolling through the screen. In fact, even though the movie is not done, theaters will turn on the lights, the, the janitorial crew will come in as if to dismiss you and tell you, you need to leave. Hundreds of names will scroll at the end of that movie, indicating all of the different people and talents who pulled their efforts together towards the common goal. In fact, it's not really been in recent, till, uh, recent years when people put a, a little clip at the end of the credits to make us stay till the very end, and then I think they scroll it extra slow just because they know we want to see something at the end and we have, we have to make it all the way through to the bottom. There are sections of scripture that kind of feel like that, like Genesis chapter 5 and that long genealogy that you read through all of those names, or Nehemiah chapter 7 and that long list of names of all the people who contributed on the rebuilding of the wall. And sometimes, kind of like at the movie, we just kind of gloss and skip over that because I wasn't there, I don't know who that is, and it seems really indifferent. I'm not really a part of the big picture in the story. But I'll tell you, there, there's something about that. If, if we miss what God is showing through the genealogies or the list of names, there, there, there's a fundamental truth to life that's being shown through those passages. Life is about people. Life is all about people. So God's grand redemptive plan was carried out through people. God's will, the expression of his desire and plan for us was told through the stories of people. In fact, Peter would use the language that you, you and me, our relationship with Christ is of a people. He says, you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And yes, it is a collective. We're a group of saved people. We are a collective of those who have obeyed the gospel, but there's something unique, isn't there? There's something distinctive about that word, people. Ricky's Wednesday walk uh, this past week was fantastic if you didn't get a chance to read it because he talked about a time when he was talking with another preacher, Dan Shibley, about some issues he had in the congregation, not this one. And he was talking about some frustrations he had, and Dan's response was simply this, Ricky, they're just people. They're just people. Second Timothy chapter 4, what Paul is writing to Timothy is this. They're just people. Second Timothy 4, beginning in verse 9, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. And my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anesphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick in Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. There's some truths about people that Paul the aged wanted his son in the faith to understand. What's precious about these words is understanding not only are these the last words we have recorded in Scripture from the Apostle Paul, but this is the last letter we have from Paul written to Timothy. Some of the truths about people is simply just that people disappoint. Verse 16, At my first defense, no one supported me. No one stood with me. All deserted me. At a time of great need, 
in a time of defense for something which would have caused great rallying of believers, defense of the gospel, in spite of the fact that Paul had taught and encouraged and preached and wrote, he said, none stood with me. You notice his heart, though. He doesn't say, none stood with me. May the Lord pay them for their deeds. May God smite them for their lack of courage. None stood with me may not be counted against them. Because sometimes brethren disappoint. Because sometimes friends disappoint us. Because sometimes our family disappoint us. Our mates disappoint us. Our children disappoint us. Because sometimes people let us down. And that's a good lesson to be reminded of. God gave people for people. He looked in Genesis 2 and realized the one thing that wasn't good from his creation was that it's not good for man to be alone. But an issue begins, good brethren, when we, be, when we take people and put them in a place of God in our life. When I expect my mate to be my savior, when I expect my spouse to be my, my savior, my children to be my God, my friends to be my all-satisfying source in my life, because I'll be honest with you, if my mate looks to me to be God in her life, she's going to have a miserable life. Because in verse 16, there are times when she has needed me and I have not been there. That I have not stood with her and I disappointed. Can we be there? Have you been there too? The times when we should have stood by, the times when we should have been counted on, but we didn't say the thing we should have said. But we didn't keep the commitments that we said we we're going to keep that we didn't act the way that God's people ought to act. Verse 16 is why relationships can never play, take the place of God in our lives. No one stood with me, but verse 17, but God stood with me. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Christ is our life. Because when others let us down and others fail us, Jesus will never fail us. Jesus will never let us down. There is never a time in which he is not by our side. There are some who try to hurt us. He mentioned in verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith, who did much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. And there are some. There are some who, who tend to hurt, who aim to wound who by guile or evil or envy or jealousy or selfish ambition or simply just evil motives wield their words like weapons, who take the word of God and use it as a battering ram and cram their positions down the throats of others, who judge rather than help. There are some who intend to hurt and to wound and to destroy, to tear down instead of building up. And yet his response, much like Joseph's, very different, isn't it? His response to those who departed from him and didn't stood by him was, may it not be counted against them. They didn't do it in guile and evil and evil intent. But his response in verse 16 is, or verse 14 is, the Lord will repay him. And Joseph, when his brothers came cowering before him, thinking that Joseph was going to enact revenge, says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? And so when people come and they intend to hurt and to wound and to discourage and tear us down, Paul's response is, I'm, I'm not going to let that get under my skin. I'm not going to let that lead me into further sin. They may intend evil, but I'm not going to respond in evil. I'm going to leave that in the hands of God. It's not my place to get even, and it's not my place to get revenge. I'm leaving that with the Lord, and the Lord will repay them and repay him for what he has done. Because there are some in our lives who simply want to hurt. And there are some who fall away. In verse 10, For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica, having loved this present world. The passage doesn't really have the, the great emphasis to it if we're not familiar with Demas, because there was a time when Demas was associated with Paul as a believer. In fact, there was a time when Paul considered him a fellow worker in the gospel. And yet distracted, lured away by the world. He left King Jesus, he left his calling, he left the Lord, and he left Paul. Sometimes people don't finish what they start. Sometimes people don't keep their commitment to King Jesus. One of the most painful realities of life is not death. 
but it's when our living loved ones have forsaken the Lord and turned away from Him. When they choose to abandon the faith that they committed to and the promise that they kept, when they abandon what it is they know to be right, there may not be anything more painful when we see loved ones leave the Lord. But we never stop praying and we never stop reaching and we never stop admonishing as a brother, as Paul would say. We never stop trying to win them back. We never give up on that soul because some change for the better. Perhaps one of the most beautiful verses in this section is in verse 11 when he says, Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. Mark, who's also known as John, went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. But something along the way happened because as Paul and Barnabas continued to travel and to preach, John Mark didn't finish. And so when Paul and Barnabas were gearing and preparing for their second trip, Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark, and Paul wasn't going to have it. He said Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. He didn't commit. He didn't see it through for whatever reason, and Paul was bothered by it. So what's the difference? What happened then in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Who changed? Well, John Mark changed. It might have been that the Mark that we're reading here is the same Mark that Peter mentions. Mark, my son, and perhaps having spent time with Peter, his faith changed. His devotion changed. His belief in God matured to where he could be trusted on. But it's not just that John Mark changed, Paul changed. Because Paul, that crispy, judgmental, harsh apostle in Acts 15, now realized the good need for a brother who, because of time and patience and teaching, grew. Good brethren, if we could just give each other time and patience and teaching and opportunity within every single one of us, it's a potential for growth, that we would be something we're not today, better, stronger, wiser. That, that, that is the whole point of Christ's plan in this congregation, that he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What do you say? Well, I, I put certain positions, teachers and shepherds, and in the past, apostles and prophets, but the goal is this. They're going to keep on working and teaching and providing for you because where you are today is not where you're going to stay. And where we are today is not where we're going to stay. Because if we would just look back as to where we have been, as to where we are now, every one of us could say what Paul is, and that is by the grace of God, I'm not who I used to be. Even though today we know we're not all what we should be or even all what we could be. And so we keep pressing on. Every one of us can change. And we need to believe that. And some are true friends. In verse 19, greet Prisca and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila, some genuine friends of the aged apostle. Priscilla and Aquila were the ones who, when kicked out of Rome, met Paul in Corinth and they found a quick bond as they not only had the same trade and making tents, but they opened their home to Paul and allowed him to stay and to work and to learn together. And in, in verse 8 of this context, when they, when Paul travels to Ephesus, continuing on his plan to preach the gospel, they go with them. And so as Paul later, when writing the letter to the church at Corinth, he mentions Aquila and Priscilla, and he says, the churches of Asia send you greetings, Aquila and Priscilla, together with the church in their house, sends you hearty greetings in the Lord. Brethren, you were useful, and they used their blessings for good. They opened their home for the brethren. In fact, there's a statement he would use in Romans 16 when he says, Greet Prisca, Priscilla, and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, look, who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Genuine, trusted, honest, loving 
footprints. One of the favorite things I loved that our brother Ryan Boyer said in his uh, weekend meeting with us a few weeks ago came out of that passage in Matthew 19, 29, when he says, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or farms for my name's sake shall receive many times as much and shall inherit eternal life. Some of the closest relationships, some of those, the most intimate connections, some of the people we trust most dear have come here. How many mothers do we have in the kingdom of God? How many father figures who have devoted their lives and their care and their strength to helping young men and young women form their faith? How many brothers and sisters, people who would give their lives, who have helped in times of need, who have stood by your side when you feel that you are alone, who have strengthened us when we needed it most desperate. Our strongest relationships have come from this beautiful family. Can you see those orange boxes and appreciate what Paul is saying about people? Because we have that in our life. We have those people in our lives. Those people exist in God's family. Brethren, those family exist among us. Those exist here. There's some things we have to understand about people, which is why there are some things Paul had to say about Timothy which is an indication of how he is to relate with his brethren. In verse 3, he says, The time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn their ears away from truth and aside from myths. Again, there are some who's going to depart from the truth. There are some who are not going to seek what is right and what is true. Now look at verse 5. How does verse 5 begin? Every verse is important, but these words are crucial to understanding our relationship with people. But you, but as for you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. There may be some people who depart. There may be some people who are not on the right path. There may be some people who are evil and intent and motive. But as for you, Despite what others are doing, how they are behaving, how they are treating you, you are to be different. Paul has done this for Timothy all along the way. Go back with me in your text. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Notice how he did it in the first letter. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, Paul begins this chapter by saying, But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, Some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. And some are going to fall away. Some are going to be falling into great sin and into error. Look at verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Let no one despise your youth. Let no one look down on you, even though you're in the the youthful season of your life. Therefore, you show yourself an example. My young brethren who are here, I still think I'm kind of in that category. I'll talk about that in a minute. I think I'm in the season of youth. I'm going to hang on to it for a while. I'll say this as an aside. It It was a crippling moment yesterday when Holly was cutting my hair. And she was making a joke to Noah, saying, should I buzz it off? And he goes, no, he's bald enough already. And I thought, teach me, Lord. (laughs) All right. For those who are in our youthful season of life, for us, when there are some who are older than us and they're not behaving as God expects them to, when they say things they shouldn't out of criticism and judgment and harsh attitudes, Paul's saying, don't, don't follow their example. Don't, don't return evil for evil. You may not see people acting the way they should, so you set the example for them. We set the example. And the way that we talk and the way that we behave and our love for each other, our love even for those who are contentious, and our faith 
and our purity, when others might despise, we young people, we set the example of those who are going to do something different. We're going to do something that is right. Go to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 10, Paul writes, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. He was saying, there's some people, and they're going to get it all backwards, exactly what Josh was preaching today. There's some who's going to make their priorities all about their jobs and their wealth and their, and, and their fame and their name. But not you. Even if that's the only thing you have in your home or your friends or those around you, you're going to be different. And the things that you prioritize and the things that you pursue, you're not going to get caught up with greed and envy, but you're going to be a person who has their value in the right place, who realizes the immense value of their faith and of the kingdom of God, and are going to let that be what it is that you pursue wholeheartedly. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three and verse one. But realize this that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, and godly. He would say in verse nine that they will not make any further progress, their folly will be obvious to all. Look at verse ten. However, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as what happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of all of them, the Lord rescued me, that there are some in these last days who will run into sin and into ungodliness, and their example is going to be evident, but not you. Here's the point. Sometimes children have to pursue a different example than what was set for them at home. Sometimes young Christians have to pursue a different example than the one that was set for them by the, example, by the generation before them. Bad examples are not an excuse for bad behavior. If my boss is rude, that gives me no right to be rude in response. If my neighbor is ugly, that gives me no justification to respond with ugliness. If there are brethren who are content at judging one another and tearing one another down and honestly discussing the scripture by casting stones, you be different. We be different. That's the point he's saying. Can you go back to that list in 2 Timothy 4 and see what he's saying? Some are going to fall away. Some are going to get distracted. Some are going to disappoint you, but not you. We're not always going to have the right example around us. Well, Paul's point then is, then be the right example. Then you be that right example for others. Because there's one more element about Timothy's relationship. In one sense, it's about his relationship to the people, to the brethren. But in the midst of all of this, he's really getting Timothy to see his relationship to, to Paul. And to a generation that was ready to depart. Paul seemed to understand in, in the time he wrote this letter that his, his end was imminent. He was heading to Caesar, and that was a one-way path, the end of his life. And so what he impresses upon Timothy is, even now, even at this point in my life, and in your life, there's something you have that I need. As my life is coming to an end, there's something I need from you. Verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. That's what we need. That's what every older generation needs. That when the body is cold, we need clothing, comfort, things to encourage and to help, small acts of service, small gifts of kindness, ways that we can ease those who are facing any kind of ailment or hardship. When the mind is bored, we need books. He didn't say, you know, I've kind of learned a lot. In fact, I kind of wrote the book to say, I've wrote a lot of these books, and so I don't really need anything. No, there's more I have to learn. There's more I have to understand. 
There's more that I have that I'm still trying to understand. My dad right now is paring down his library, and every time I'm going up there, he's giving books. And every now and then I'll say, well, what about that one? And he says, don't touch that one. I'm not done with that yet. Because we always have more that we're going to learn. In fact, when the Spirit is hungry, we need Scripture. There are many who believe that when he's saying the parchments, he's talking about the sacred Scripture, the roles of God's Word. And even though he had the inspiration of the Spirit, what it was that he wanted was to see, to read, to take in the bread of life, to be comforted by God's own words. When the body is lonely, we need companionship. Letters are nice, but nothing takes the place of face-to-face relationships, connections. There's really two things that flow from this. One, there's no retirement in the kingdom of God. There's not a retirement plan that if you've served for so many years, if we have put in so much work and labor at a certain point, we have reached a certain age and it's time for the young guns to take over, right? I must decrease and you must increase. And so we're going to step out and let them serve. That, That doesn't exist in the kingdom of God. It works in the corporate world, but not in God's world, not in this world. Because Paul still knew there's more he had to do. There's more he had to learn. There's more that he had to offer. And for every one of us, it may not be the same capacity as where we were before and the same extent. But for every one of us here, there's still more that we have to learn. There is, and there will be until the day that Christ comes. And there is something, something. It may not be what it was. It may not be what you want. But there is something that every single one of us can do in the service of God. The other side of this, and this one hurts a bit. He didn't just say it once. He didn't just say, hey, come bring the cloak. Verse 9, make every effort to come to me soon. And verse 13, when you come, bring the cloak. And then in verse 21, make every effort to come before winter. Can you hear what he's saying? I just want you to come. I want you to come. I just want to be encouraged and strengthened by you. Not one of us stand where we are without the help of a generation that came before us. And they are passing before our eyes. If there's anything that we can learn from them, any wisdom we can gain from them, and if there's any way that we can offer any help or encouragement or comfort or strength before the winter comes and that window is gone, We must go. Ricky wrote in this Wednesday's walk, yes, we are just people. We ought to strive to be just, to be like God in our hearts, character, and behavior, but also give people the latitude to be flawed. No one will ever meet the expectation of perfection. Robert Turner also said, if you expect perfection or nothing, you will get nothing. Let people be people. Let them develop. Give them time to change. Give them time to grow. They don't have to be me. After all, someone somewhere extended God's mercy to me. You see what Paul is saying here? In verses 1 and 2, he is giving him a charge to continue to preach the word. In verses 3 and 4, he's saying why. Because people are going to continue to depart and they have to have that anchor, that firm foundation to call them back. And so in verse 5, he says it again. You have to do this work. And verse 6 through 8, he's saying, because my time's coming and I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm not going to be able to do this with you because I'm leaving. And so you have to keep on and you have to keep on doing this work because I'm leaving. And then he talks about people. He says in verse 8, I'm finishing the race, I've finished the course, and I'm going on to the goal, I'm heading on to heaven, so you keep working so you can reach that same goal. And then he talks about people. Here's the point. We're not going to finish this race alone. We're not going to finish this fight, this course, this faith, isolated and apart from one another. What's the so what, the walking off the page of this? We're just people. 
Remember, we're just people. We are people who need great patience and grace. We're people who need time to change and opportunities to change. We need people who believe in us and will stand with us and not apart from us. We're people who will fail, and that is not an excuse for sin, but an understanding that we're not going to do it perfect. But we're people who need people. We're people who need love. We're people who need those who are going to pray for us and never give up on us. Because we're people who need Jesus. And so if I want you to be patient with me and gracious with me, if I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt and to stand by my side when I'm weak, then I need to be the same to you and to be just as loving, just as patient, and just as gracious. We're not Jesus. We're just people trying to be like him. We're just people who need him. And if you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, today is that beginning time. That if you are willing to turn from your sins to confess him as Christ and to be baptized, today you would be immersed, coming out of that water, adopted as a child of God. But it could be if you're here today, surrounded by people, people who love one another and love the Lord. If you've come in a time and a place where you need some help and some encouragement and some strength, we would love to help you. And we'd love to stand with you. We would love to help you lead from here on the right path with your God. If we can help you in any way, let's do it right now as we stand and as we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can, but thank you for connecting with us.